Perfect. So thank you. Before I start, is my I want to make sure I get your name right. Yeah. Bertram, is that how I say it? Yeah, man, you nailed it. Okay, good. I was about to say, oh my gosh, I was like, man, I don't want to mess up his name. <laughs> uh, you got it. I, I appreciate you asking too. <laughs> nice, nice. So Bertram, you're an actor, right? You you get on these roles, you get these things, and people start to get a notoriety to you. But where did the initial love for acting come from? Especially because most times when people get into it, it's either they were acting kids or they got the acting bug late. Where does your journey fit in this spectrum? Yeah, well, I I got interested in acting and performing on stage pretty young. So I would say I'm early on the spectrum. Uh, my parents enrolled me in some arts and theater camps when I was in early elementary school. My first lead role, get this mic, was that of Jesus Christ in my church's uh, <laughs> resurrection story play. And so it was around the time that I people really started to celebrate me for um, for you know carrying a presence on stage that I, I got bit by the bug and. I went on to participate in a lot of community theater uh, through my like late high school and early college days. And so that kind of laid the foundation for me to keep pushing into TV and film. Nice, and are, I'm not wrong, if, are you from Memphis? Is yeah, you... born, born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. You know, it's funny, whenever people are from like, country, um, I would say um, cities like Memphis or the, um, you know, or the states like the Carolinas, community mm -hmm. theater is a thing that really, really does it. You know, why yeah. is that for, you know, those kind of like Southern Midwest states that community theater is where the actors, before you get to Hollywood, where you get your start? Yeah, it is. Well, community theater in Southern cities specifically, is our playground. It is our access point because many of the cities in, those, in that region, in this region, uh, don't really have much play with the industry. So there aren't as many uh, television, film, or commercial opportunities. While there are some, they are limited. And the ones that are offered are kind of uh, kitschy, if you will. And so uh, the community theater and you know my experience has created a space to like participate in and tell stories that are black stories that are relevant to our culture that are reflective of our culture and so um yeah it it is the access point for for a lot of folks from the region for that reason nice memphis is known memphis tennessee is known for you know it, it is is very known for making artists you know what i mean not mm -hmm. making, not necessarily actors but per se but it's a very creative like you know just jazz blues country it doesn't matter rap it's you know how has being from memphis shaped you as an actor yeah uh memphis is definitely a hotbed for creativity because we sit at this nexus point in that region that we just talked about in the south and so you got like eight or so southern states that kind of find memphis as this nucleus of of culture and so it has influenced me in a lot of ways because uh memphis is a a, a southern city but it's also very urban right and so with that comes a set of obstacles that anybody from the real city has to navigate and so growing up in Memphis city schools, you develop a certain set of skills, be it like getting your humor chops up so you can defend people trying to check you, which is what yeah. we call like Jones in the shooting, the, playing the dozens on people here. Yeah. Um, but also we got so many good examples of people who succeeded in the creative space. So we are uh, on the music side, we've had Stax Records and folks like Isaac Hayes that have served as heroes for us. We've had acting legends um like for example um elise neal she uh has done pretty well in tv and film she went to my high school and so to be able to see people like that who have been able to kind of break this proverbial glass ceiling of a southern yeah. city they really kind of set the the pace and model for us what it looks like to to enter these spaces and create uh and, and it's one of those things where it's like this compounding effect, right? Because we've been that space for so long, way back to the days of enslavement, right? Yeah. For people to come and get a little piece of culture on Bill Street. And so that thing has only grown over time and over time. So I say it's in our blood, yeah. 
Nice. I love that. Now, where's your journey been for acting? You know, high school, college. When did you say, okay, I'm about to go and now I'm going to take you to LA. I'm going to take you to New York or I'm going to take you to New Orleans. And I say that because these are like, or even Atlanta, the four hotbeds where it comes to people wanting to like, you know, break into. Yeah. So I'm still at that launch point, right? I'm at a, a place in my career where like I've got a lot of time in, but I'm still super young in the, is it like by industry standards? Mm -hmm. um, and so like, I don't know if um, you heard or come across this story in that, like I, I met Katori Hall, the writer and showrunner of Pea Valley in a commu local community theater uh, mm -hmm. called, ha called Hattie Lou Theater. And so it was a <coughs> kind of fleeting conversation with her about this television show that she was working on called Pea Valley that really got my wheels turning. Yeah. And that is my first uh, is my first role, my first television uh, role. And so like I, I say that to say that I'm still on the ledge, bro. Like I, I'm considering the move to Atlanta or Los Angeles any day now. Yeah. Um, and I'm also benefiting from this new um, uh, audition style, being able to do stuff virtually. Yeah. And so while there are benefits to being in those different hotbed cities, I'm still able to get my tapes in and make connections with people who I foresee being able to help me continue can continue on this journey. Nice. Is it for you going down this journey to like make that commitment to a new city? You know, that's a lot you pick up, you, you know, that's where you're like, you got your savings and everyone has that story, right? Right. For you, when will you know it's time for Bertram to go? Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm about to go. You know, because walking on faith and walking ridiculous sometimes can seem the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think for me, uh, man, if we keeping it all, all the way, G, it's going to be like what these checks look like, what these rates look like for these next roles. You know, yeah. that will, and uh, ever, you know, definitely play a, um, a role in my decision making and I got to be honest bro too I uh, when I'm not acting like I'm pretty deeply entrenched in some work in my city and so I'm torn in that regard not really wanting to leave this work behind and yeah. so it's going to take more than you know some checks it's going to take like uh, like I guess the opportunity or the me developing the capacity to continue supporting the work that I've been supporting already and yeah I don't know what that's going to look like but like you say I'm just kind of exercising faith trust and spirit to yeah. know when it you know when it's time that it'll be time nice you know and especially because if I'm looking at your social presence you do a lot of like you know back to nature types of things and you do a lot of like social activism not like on a grand scale but like you know where you're trying to encourage people but how do you have that balance you know what I mean do you you know what I mean because most people when it's like acting that's just that and then other people yeah. are like green thumb they're just that or if they're you know so it's like you don't choose one lane you kind of just take it all in and compartmentalize yeah I um so I prior to jumping into this acting space uh I've been a civil servant like working in nonprofit and public service for the better part of my life and it's something that has been passed down to me from my ancestors, my great grandmother, Bertha Wilbur, uh, fought in our city for affordable housing and safe spaces for black folks. And so that is how I've been trained up. And it's almost like this opportunity to tell stories is icing on the cake. And so I'm able to compartmentalize because, you know, I prioritize my ability to show up and serve people in a way that will never be challenged by or prioritized under opportunities in TV and film, if I'm being frank, because I got a duty to my people. And so, um, and so, you know, it, it can get tricky. Like for example, when we were filming the second season of Pea Valley, I had to do a whole lot of traveling. And so um, I can't by any stretch of the imagination proclaim that I, I got it figured out or that I even got it balanced, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But um, I do know that I have a commitment to both of these ways that I show up in the world and I'm going to keep, you know, figuring out, figuring it out as I go. You know, and, uh, <clears throat> I think that's so beautiful. And, um, you know, when I'm thinking about like a story about you, you know, this might not even be I, 
I really want to touch on the civil servant. Like, you know, you really have these strong ties and strong, like, this obligation from which your ancestors have laid for what the next generation needs, you know? Yeah. Where did that come from? You know what? It's actually, bro, at this point in time, from a place of necessity, because you, I'm about to nerd out real quick on you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, I, I, I find so much joy in being able to create, right? in a, a, a lot of mediums but we as a people as a country as a, a globe we have to start thinking differently about how we treat our planet how we produce and consume food what we consume and so it's like all of that tv shit is cool but we can't do it but for so long if we don't have a planet to do it all you know yeah. what i mean no, and so cool. i i've really um had to work to honor that in this walk because it is enticing to just dive head first into the glitz and glam of tv but at the end of the day i'm thinking about having children one day and i want them to inherit a space that is livable and i want them to have food that is good for them and so that is how and why i really lean in and really promote these ideas around sustainability uh, urban agriculture et cetera et cetera et cetera Nice. No, I love that. I actually, um, I have my um, certificate in urban planning. When I was in college, I wanted to be an urban planner. So no. I was a geography major. <laughs> but That's I, crazy. Business and stuff. Yeah, I got a, um, I started a master's program in city and regional planning too. Oh, so wow. See, and I actually have my master's in, um, one of my master's is in um, commerce and economic development. That's crazy, bro. Yeah, <laughs> my my undergrad is in economics, so oh, right, see, sure, right. <laughs> we nerd out over here. Yeah, uh, shoot. Yeah. Um, and aren't you an Omega too, right? I am an Omega. Yeah, man. I'm an oh, Alpha. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh, okay. <laughs> it sounds good. With the uh, what uh, one of my good, my mentors now, uh, he said we can, we can root six from time to time. You know what I'm saying? So it's all love. Uh, yeah, um, I was like, man, I got this hat on. I wasn't even thinking about it. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> But you know, yeah, really right. take the, um, the story and really talk about that, like social activism, you know, sustainability with um, Bertram, because I think it's such a, a beautiful story. Why is it so important for you? And this is how this is even how I tell my writers. I'm like, look, you might go in there thinking you're about to talk about something, but when you have this nugget of truth come out, go that way. It's sprouting. Yeah. From how important is it for our community? to really dive deeper into like, you know, not just the Gen Z's and TikToks and social media, black squares and, you know, but how important is it for us to really get on the ground and really do the work? Forget the social media, forget the phones, but like really be out there. You're out there, you know, you're really like, I seen one of your posts, you were telling people like you were out in front of something talking about like vote or something. Oh yeah, how, yeah. You know, how important is it for us to really be out there? Well, I, I'll say this, that, the like social media world that we live in has its advantages like that post that you just referenced of me so promoting um just the power of the vote speaks to that right yeah and so um i don't you know feel good about shitting on gen z or whoever else who lives kind of in this virtual space but to your point there is uh what i consider to be like a happy medium or mm -hmm. this this yes and opportunity to leverage these tools, but to have them, like you mentioned, grounded in what are real world, real community issues. And so I think the way we do that is simple, bro. It's like, yeah, you can spend your evenings on the gram or on TikTok, but carve out a couple hours a day to get out in the faces of people because that's where the conversations that really need to be had are being had. And so it looks like doing community in real time just as much as we will in the virtual space. And, you know, for some folks that may look like a neighborhood association that's kind of on the, you know, small end of the spectrum. But I think that that can really be scaled up for folks to consider like uh, in their pursuit of employment, thinking about how they can serve in like local government or nonprofit spaces. Or even more importantly, and this is something I really like to hit on, it's like this idea that because our generation is made of so many entrepreneurs, to realize that this notion of like social, social entrepreneurship is our way out. 
And yeah. so thinking creatively about products that we can develop, organizations or enterprises that we can build to help address some of these issues and TikTok the whole damn way. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> that, that's the science, I feel, knowing that we got power and agency and it's gonna require that same generation, Gen Z millennials, to yeah. think creatively, develop these enterprises that will help us make our way out of this shithole that folks have dug us into. <laughs> no, definitely. And I and I appreciate that because before starting a magazine in tandem, I also started our um, our um, nonprofit called the Catalyst Black Academy. I have over a decade of like you know entrepreneur training with also with my pedigree. So I did a thing where we would take black entrepreneurs to a three month free training program. And because I told people a lot of times, I, you know, everything was like Black Lives Matter and all this stuff. And I told people once that ends, once the world stops caring to a degree where they're not changing filters and they're not promoting it and it becomes just as normal as Black History Month, you're going to lose that support. You're going to lose that traction. So we need to make sure we build the mental capacity because yeah. business is all mental. You can have all the tools, you can be creative, but if you don't have the mental strength, the mental dexterity, you're, yeah. you will, you won't, you won't succeed. So it's funny you said that because of that social type of entrepreneurship, that social capital. Yeah. I tell people like with this, we have to be honest with ourselves too. You know, everybody's not meant to be a business owner. Everybody, yeah. some people are meant to work at Apple. Some people are meant to work at Starbucks. Like right. just because it's, it's tough, you know, everybody's not meant to be in your shoes as a social, you know, justice activist, actor, phil philanthropist, gardener, you know what I mean? You are who you are because you love it. So I just think it, it's, it's, it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And kudos to you, brother. Because, and you are modeling exactly what I just described, right? You've got the business acumen, you develop your business entity, but you thought it not robbery to lift as you climb, you know? Yeah, and so, uh, kudos, <laughs> and, that, and that's the trick, man. I, I feel like we have that capacity and it's on, it's on us to really think uh to think that way and to deliver for upcoming gen generations nice uh now getting back on to you when it came to what is it about it that like really pulls your heartstrings when you're out there with people when you're out there fighting you know what i mean when you're out there you know you're i always tell people you put yourself on the line anytime you go to do any type of activism you know because you never know what's happening you don't you know you're you're opening up your space to strangers to social media you know it's 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 a fine line nowadays you know because even as your own brand as you're growing people can go to your social media and say oh he might be too much or you know when you're in person so what what is it about you know, creating change that really tugs your heart? Yeah, I think it is rooted in this um, desire to survive, bro. As simple as that, because a lot of the systems that have been put in place that have oppressed people like us, uh, if they aren't corrected for, they stand to continue to harm us in ways that will ultimately um, make it even tougher for future generations to thrive, right? And so is that awareness and that, I guess, desire and need to fight, right? To fight oppression, to fight systems. And I, I wanna you know, be clear on something too, though, in that I uh, am deeply committed to the work. Uh, I do find myself most connected to like strategic efforts. And so in the recent years, I've been less apt to attend a protest than I would be to help a friend or myself develop a program that will get some really beneficial time in with young people or a group of people who is looking for uh, some service or guidance. And so um, with that being said too, uh, the thing that really speaks to my heart, bro, is working with young people uh, because I know the impact that mentors and other like orgs or social entrepreneurs have had on me as a young person. Yes. And so it's really uh, something I've taken on is like, uh, you know, they say service is the rent you pay to live. And I think it's because people have invested in me. Like I, I feel duty bound to invest in other people. And so you know, the young people, I find so much inspiration in working with them. They come from a variety of like circumstances and no matter what, like I, I can see a light in a young person 
that yeah. feels similar to me. And I feel like it's my duty to support that, to help help them folks shine even more. And so that's what that's what really does it for me, bro. Nice. Um, earlier, you said, um, was it your grandmother that fought for rights in there? Can you, um, you know, let me make sure to get her name right. And also Absolutely, man. What that do for you, like this legacy for your family. Yes, man. So it is uh, my great grandmother, my father's grandmother. Her name is Bertha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mixing up my name and her name. Her name. <laughs> I'm about to say, I'm, I'm hoping those, I do not want to dispel this. Same yeah, word. right, right. That was going to be tough, but it's pretty simple. Her name is Bertha Wilbur. And um, she is uh, actually from a small town in Tennessee, but moved to Memphis at the age of two and just fell into activism because uh, our home or our family's neighborhood in South Memphis in the Florida and Kansas area was undergoing this um, uh, the threat from urban renewal, which was a program that swept through the country that basically obliterated a lot of black communities. And so as this was happening, uh, my grandmother kind of like me out of necessity started yelling out like, yo, this shit ain't right. They are taking the homes of my neighbors. We are under threat and we need to do something about it. And because she was vocal, she ended up in some leadership positions and some uh, neighborhood activists uh, organizations and you know just to round out her story her work and commitment um, was so uh, inspiring and respected that uh, in the mid 80s they went on to name a uh, housing development that was geared towards creating affordable homes for people in that community, which was a big part of her mission after her. Uh, they named it Wilbert Heights and it is uh, it's in South Memphis. And so it's funny because as a teen, I started to learn more about her story. Like I knew granny growing up, right? Yeah. But as a teen, I, you know, I found a box of some articles that she had been uh, featured in and some of yeah. her writings appeals to local leaders. And so it was that finding that really kind of imprinted on me this desire to continue to, you know, lift up her legacy and to walk in her shoes. And so, um, yeah, man, shout out to my granny, Bertha Wilbur. <laughs> nice, no, I love that. That's so beautiful. What are some things that you, um, you know, really want to see kind of in at, at least through your lifetime you want to see change in this world that you really, in, at least in this country. <laughs> yeah, man. So, I, you know, I'll start at the local level because, you know, I think the way that we really achieve success in these spaces is like through a more granular approach, like sweep in front of your own front door, as people yeah. say. Mm -hmm. And so what I, when I think about my legacy, would like to see is a reimagining of our food production system. Because right now it's going to shit on average, any piece of produce in your grocery store might travels 1500 miles before it gets there. That to me is absolutely insane. And so I wanna play whatever role I can in shortening that process so that people can eat food that is grown closer to them, that carries the nutrients that will help them live a healthy life. And so uh, that's gonna show up in a lot of ways. I, um, I run a small urban farm in my neighborhood. I work with a group of uh, local growers who are thinking about this issue and all the way up to, uh, you know, me partnering with people who are actually developing communities of the future known as agrihoods that will incorporate agriculture into our physical neighborhoods as a means to address like food insecurity. And so that is what, um, you know, that's what I'm after in this season of my life. We may, you know, meet again in a couple of years. And I, after having made some progress in this space, I may be on to something different. But right now, it's really about um, garden literacy and uh, food security. Nice. I love that. I love that because I have seen a lot of uptake with a lot of even some of my close friends and people I know that are like having their shrooms, um, like gardens and, you know, people are doing it even in the even in neighborhoods where they may not have the biggest patch of land, like even small yeah. they're growing. It's like this new type of urban agriculture renaissance for black people now because they're really kind of like taking it back to like, you know, all of us come from the southern roots and they're kind of like mm -hmm. going back to that. Yeah, man. And I um, so I think we are getting to a place where we are 
re far enough removed from the trauma that we have with like land and agriculture. And we are remembering, bro, that our grandparents, a lot of them had backyard gardens or were farmers at some point. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's really inspiring and something that I, you know, try to model and support this idea that no matter how much space you got, you can use that to to produce. Yeah, nice. Um, do you watch everything since you're like real big on, um, you know, food and stuff? Do you watch everything you like intake or do you have like cheap moments or do you like say, I, I don't mind junk food? Or are you that person where it's like, nope, I can't if I don't understand the ingredients on there, I'm not touching it, get this out of my face. Right. No, I'm not there yet. Uh, so, <laughs> there's <laughs> so, levels yeah, to it. <laughs> there's levels to it. And, you know, I'll say that, in my, you know, my family and my community, we uh, we just try to practice moderation. Right. And so, I, you know, I'll say as it relates to meat, for example, you know, it wouldn't be nothing for me to tear up a 10 piece wing even this week. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, I might choose five or six days to go without me. And yeah. so. I'm not thinking about like these labels, vegetarianism, veganism from this, what can be like an egoic perspective, you know what I mean? Oh my God. And, <laughs> and that's, you know, with no shade to folks who are that, because I think that there is a whole lot of wisdom in like, like you said, being really disciplined and mindful uh, about what you take in. But right now I'm just happy with keeping it balanced. Like I'm gonna eat my vegetables, but I might fuck around and eat some Takis once a month. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Just keeping it real. Just keeping it real. Uh, no, I love that. I love that. You know, um, and ending on this note, what is something that you want to, like, what, I would say this, what message do you want to leave for the next generation, especially the next generation of Black folks? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think it was Stokely Carmichael who, was asked and fact check me before you print this in the thing, bro. <laughs> 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 when, when asked about like what three things we need to prioritize as a people, as a community, he said unity, unity, and unity, right? And that's something that I would echo in that we have developed in a way where folks are super successful. Uh, we are kind of entering uncharted territories with like, virtual spaces, entrepreneurship, uh, new access to job opportunities. And what that has done in some instances is created these silos, uh, be it like geographic silos, class silos, um, religious silos, you know, insert your, you know, your group. And I think we have learned to just kind of exist in that group safely and comfortably. But what this next age is gonna require of us is more unity and more diversity within our community. And that's one thing I appreciate about your magazine, because like we talked about earlier, you were trying to hint at the nuances within Black culture. And I feel like for us to really excel and succeed uh, as a people, uh, it will require us being intentional about sharing space with people who aren't from our groups, you know? Yeah. And, you know, that will look like Hell, I don't know what it's going to look like. Maybe it's for somebody else to figure out. <laughs> it, it, it will require like a, a commitment to unity within our uh, within our community. Nice. I love that. And I think it's so important. I, that's why for me, it's it's one of those things where what you're talking about is so is so true, because when you go through the magazine, I want you to be able to see somebody. We have anybody who's non-binary, but then you can see that same person and then you can see someone who does trap music and then you can see a doctor story. You know, my, my job is to, I think it's so important that people can just see all black stories, but not sectioned off, you know, because yep. that's what we kind of do because we, we feel this, I really say it's this Anglo-Saxon way of life that we have, to have everything grouped in a way, you know, a thing yep. is a thing. I tell people, and I'm not, I'm not gonna put that on this part. When I, <laughs> but I tell people all the time, I said, look, listen, I love all races or anything, but I said, White people are the only people that go somewhere and always have to label something. I said, and then we take that habit. I said, everywhere we go, we have to label something. I said, no one asked for these labels. I said, we right. get far left, we go right. I said, you know, and it, and it comes from that Eurocentric mindset that a thing has to be a thing. Psychologically, yes, we have to make things happen. 
but we don't have to put labels and we get so confused with that. So, you know, then that's why we have LGBTQ2I plus and I'm a gay man married. And I'm like, even then when they're like going, I'm like, how many labels yeah. out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I think it really confuses us. And it's, it, it, it's like what you said, we get in more silos because even within the, even in the LGBT community, we get in silos there. It's like mm-hmm. parts of the LGBT here, the two I plus mm-hmm. here, you know what I mean? Then it's like, yeah. well, what did we really do? <laughs> <laughs> Like at the yeah. end of the day, did we actually help ourselves with this, or did we kind of confuse more of ourselves? Yeah, man. Yeah, that uh, that is definitely a Euro European practice to try to name something, and I feel like yeah, maybe that's a part of the mission too, is like unnaming or renaming based yeah. on our understanding, based on our ancient wisdom, you know, and and not being so beholden to their ideas about how people or plants or whatever should be grouped so that's kind of that's kind of revolutionary bro and whatever i can do to kind of help with that renaming maybe that'll be a a campaign or something of your magazine to like really kind of stake our claim and rename you know rename our groups rename the things that 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 matter to us uh as a as a place of rebellion there's power in the word and so yeah i'm with you i appreciate you mentioning that no, thank you. And then before I leave, I'll say this. I um, got uh, like five more minutes, but um, sure. that's the thing I was telling uh, uh, one of my, um, this is off the record of it. I can actually okay. stop 